Um, so um, just before we uh, get into some of your questions, one of the one of the questions actually that came uh, earlier on, uh, and I think it's a theme through all of the talks really, um, is about communication and and the the fact that PPE has really sort of um, disrupted our communication between uh, between individuals. Um, and uh, maybe uh, if I can start off with Sue. Um, Sue, um, have you found any ways to improve? Our, um, uh, our communication techniques during during the pandemic with all the PPE on? I, I, that's a great question. I mean, you, you all have seen the, the masks with the cutout. Um, I think we're now starting to understand that visors have got limited use. Um, studies from Switzerland are suggesting that, uh, you know, that the uh, control of infection doesn't really help. So being able to see the full face and having mass technology um, which allows you to see facial expression um, and lip read if, if that's appropriate obviously is what you're looking for the gold standard but having other means of communication written communication um, sort of you know um, speech to to written transcription i think we've just got to be more technology aware and, and try and use different alternatives but what it all really comes down to is that it's going to take more people, it's going to take longer. And when you pile additional things into a system, which COVID effectively has had to do, trying to get the same system um, function with the same number of people is a massive strain on the system. And so, you know, when you're looking at the system and the limitations of technology, uh, of communication, you need to put more into that system rather than just stretching it further and further because it will break. Yeah, I think I think that's been um, something that we've seen in, in a lot of areas, hasn't it? That we, if we just keep sort of stretching the system and and with different ways, stretching and relaxing the system, and then expecting it to to work like a perfectly elastic system and work, you know, if we if we if we stretch the the mechanic, mechanical analogy, that we're we're expecting it to work perfectly the next time, and we may have broken some of the things in the system when we go uh, when we go for that second wave. Um, uh, Gary, you've been taking questions over on uh, on, on online. Um, what, what else have uh, people been saying? Uh, yeah, so we've had a number of questions come in, um, uh, particularly a lot before um, before we started today, which was great. Uh, so I'll start off with this question that um, I think a lot of people will be interested in, and uh, it's come up a number of times. Um, in the questions beforehand and today. Uh, and it's a very important question going forward. Um, so I'll ask this one from, uh, actually from one of our participants in the Human Factors short course. So how do we get the importance of human factors expertise into the consciousness of our politicians so that during the next pandemic or even subsequent waves of this pandemic, uh, we are hearing at least as much from human factors engineers as we do from epidemiologists and other professionals. Who'd like to have a go at that one? <laughs> Sue again. Yes, yeah, you're very brave. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get on. I'm going to get on my pedestal here. This 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 is one that I bang on about a lot. <laughs> Um, we've just had a, a paper um, that's been in, uh, gone into our, our government publication. It's called Science in Parliament. If you want um, to email me, I can send you a comment, a copy. I don't think I can put it on Twitter, but I can, I can email it to people directly. What we're now calling for is professionalising patient safety. So it, it's about saying, well, you professionalise all other areas of clinical practice, everything else that you do in healthcare. It's about time patient safety was professionalised. And what that means is people being trained and supported in training so that they get the appropriate qualifications and the background and be part of a network so that they can bring safety science, human factors, other aspects um, to play within the clinical and the healthcare team. And I really think that what COVID has done in a lot of ways, not just in, in patient safety, but in parts of our society, it's shown the cracks. It's shown where we haven't got the, the appropriate expertise or the appropriate resources or whatever in place. And so I'm, a, I'm just delighted to be part of this webinar, which we've got people bringing fantastic examples of, of human factors application, but part of multidisciplinary teams. When you look at other safety critical um, industrial sectors, 
you don't have human factors uh, engineers working in isolation. You're always part of a wider team with ethnographers, with clinicians, with psychologists, with organisational management. And it's that team approach which makes a difference. Fantastic. Um, Jan, um, have you got anything more to say about the, uh, the team approach that, that Sue mentioned? That uh, you, you brought together your infection control people, your, the human factors people, the organization, uh, organizational sociologists. Um, uh, how do you do it? How do you get them all speaking the same language? Um, I think we've, we've been really fortunate in uh, Alberta and Alberta Health Services because we have a health system that employs um, you know, getting close to a dozen human factors specialists uh, within the health system. And so there's now starting to be this understanding that um, lots of problems actually require human factors input. And we've had it into the design of some of the hospitals, um, including last minute design, um, you know, just before the concrete is poured, changing things before the concrete's poured and saving a lot of money. So we've got that history. And so people are now starting to say, can't you get human factors people to come and help us with this? So there's that understanding. But I think um, it's, it's also the fact that we, we don't come in carrying, you know, check off clipboards. We, we come in to use that um, ethnography term alongsiders and look to understand how people work. And I think we found this particularly in one of the units that we worked a lot on was that the, the nursing staff, the nursing management, and the nurses and the healthcare aides and the laundry people were all so welcoming. And it's, I think it's that relationship attitude that you go in with, like, you know, we're here to help if, if we can, and what are you having problems with? Fabulous, great. Um, any, any other questions there, Gary? Yep, so we'll just follow on from that. Uh, now, obviously, uh, as we learn more about COVID, uh, the virus itself, and as our policies and um, the situation changes, it's a very dynamic, rapidly changing environment. Um, so not only communication, is communication important, uh, but we've also got to establish trust and maintain performance. Uh, so how, what's been your experience with that and how have you um, maintained that trust and level of performance in this rapidly changing environment? Andrew, do you want to take that one? How do you maintain trust and improve clinical performance or improve system performance probably more, more broadly? Yeah, that's a great question. I think Chris also wants to say something on that, and we'll oh. probably say something similar. But uh, I think <laughs> we well, usually say exactly the same stuff. <laughs> we do. We just say it with an accent. I say well, he says it with an accent. Um, but uh, um, you know, one of the things that we've we've found is uh, if you can in, if you can get a system designed so that it functions easily, meaning you work at you work in a trauma bay. I'll give an example. I work in a trauma bay. If you can't find anything for what you need, then the, um, not only do you have the challenges of the care for the patient, but you also have the challenges that come up with when you can't find something. And we all know when we forget our car keys, when we are trying to you know, uh, try and get out the door on time and we can't find them, how stressful that is, even though when they're right in front of us. And so if we add that added layer of, of stress, then um, then, then we're simply not going to be able to achieve the performance we want. So in, then what happens in healthcare frequently is that we then spend time trying to focus on how to communicate better when if we simply designed the space better so that people could work, then they could actually focus on the clinical care. They wouldn't need to communicate so much. They wouldn't need to ask, oh, well, uh, for, I don't know where you know, uh, equipment X, Y, and Z is. We, in fact, could then focus on where the actual um, what, what the actual patient requires. So I think that uh, if we're going to achieve performance that we want, then, the, then we must very much start with, like we've already talked about, an entire team coming together, deciding on what it is our priorities are, 
understanding that we are not going to be perfect and understanding where our pitfalls might be and then design a system to support those imperfections or to mitigate those imperfections, as I should say, and then we can focus on performance and we, because we don't, we have limited time. And so we must focus on, um, we first focus on the design and I believe there will be higher yields, greater return on investment. And then we actually won't have to spend as much time, um, you know, uh, with, with the performance that we, you know, often having to, to, to do. I guess that old adage that a system um, will basically, or, or your results will uh, be based on the on the system performance rather than uh, necessarily the workarounds that the people have uh, to to make it sort of patched together to to what we can uh, to what we can do. Well, um, and as I said, the it is or the quote from James Clear is that the human behavior or the environment is the invisible hand for human behavior, and so that. Yeah. that that we, we must start with a systems yeah. approach. And, and ideally, you know, the, the ideal um, uh, environment, you don't even notice. It just, uh, it, it just sort of guides you seamlessly through the environment to, to do what needs to be done. Yeah, great. Uh, Chris, have you got anything to add to that in your, in, with your accent? Uh, yeah, so I think, um, uh, I think this issue of trust and how you carry people along during a period of immense, rapid, and momentous change is is incredibly important um, and uh, I, there's sort of two aspects that I'd like to, to just mention one is this the concept of how user-centered design and including translational stimulation can help that but then just also communication strategies uh, that are used by leadership groups say for instance in our ICU that I think have really helped so in the first instance I think anytime you do user-centered design and you get frontline workers involved in designing something early on in the piece, you know, that, that, that builds trust because they're actually there from the beginning. Uh, their voices get heard and they actually play a key role in um, designing the process that they're actually going to be implementing. So I think that's really valuable. And that's what we found is why translational simulation, even if we think it's got a diagnostic purpose, it is always an intervention as well because it changes culture. Um, and then I think the other key aspect is communication. And I guess we've had more frequent team huddles. We've had staff forums so that our leadership groups have always been keep, keeping people involved. And um, I've been very impressed with our ICU leadership group because what they've able to do is just be upfront and tell us what the situation is, uh, what things are happening, taking the time actually just to listen to concerns and acknowledge them. And even if we don't always have the answers to know that uh, they, our leadership group, are working hard to do the best for all of us. And um, that really matters. Right. Uh, any, any other questions, Gary? Anything else that we can... Uh... Stu, Stu, if I could just make a Oh, yes, comment. sorry. Yes, far, far away, yeah, Jane. Just, um, Chris's uh, mention of team huddles made me remember the, the first time we went on to one of the units and we'd done our, our walkthroughs and walkarounds and had a look and made notes and uh, had noticed a couple of things that needed changing urgently. And we went to the, uh, what some people would call the head nurse, we called the nurse manager and uh, had a quiet chat with her. And within five minutes, she had assembled um, a huddle of all the nurses who were free to come to the front desk, all right. of course uh, spaced out um, appropriately, and uh, we talked about this and talked about what should be done right away to start to make changes. And I think it's that kind of flexibility and you know willingness to to listen to different voices. And again, I think it comes down to relationships partly because I think once you build the relationships, then that gives you a little more latitude in some of the things that you might otherwise be wanting to hold back and saying. Yes, great point. It's, it is having those difficult conversations sometimes, isn't it? Making sure that um, you can put uh, put those uh, those points of view honestly and forthrightly uh, to uh, to make the change happen. Gary, yeah. So uh, moving on, here's a question that came in earlier that I thought would be. Uh, very interesting for a lot of our viewers. Uh, so one of our pediatricians in the audience has asked, um, 
So pediatric care is vital and a challenging area at the best of times. Um, but I can imagine that these challenges are heightened uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so perhaps Andrew and Andrew or Jan might be able to answer um, what challenges have been brought up in pediatric critical care and how do we respond? Or how have you responded? Uh, anyone, anyone have uh, pediatric COVID experience on the panel? No. It's, I would think that. Uh, well, maybe we'll we'll hear from uh, some of some of the audience and find out what they've done and what they've done differently. Maybe you know, it it, uh, it may just be a case of uh, doing doing the, the standard things well, doing the good the the, the normal things uh, in a in a more um, mindful way and uh, and considering those challenges. Chris, sorry. Yeah, um, I, I, I might just chime in because although I, um, I mean, we provide a pediatric lung transplant service, but we, <laughs> we don't do many pediatric lung transplants, uh, fortunately, and not during the pandemic. But having worked in um, PICU previously and seen the impact, uh, particularly in adult ICU, which is you know, a, a lot of the time we think of ICU as, um, you know, it's great because everyone's intubated and you don't need to talk to anyone. But in reality, intensive care is all about communication and communicating with the families. And in pediatrics, that's even more important. So I think that must be an immense challenge in PICU is uh, just managing the, the family interactions, particularly when, uh, so in adult ICUs, we literally banned having patient visitors for a period. And I, I mean, it's just uh, horrendous for patient experience and probably patient outcomes. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. So um, I'm, I'm just gonna give you all one final question um, just to wrap this up. And uh, it's really just to find out what you think we should be doing differently now. Um, there are a lot of places around the world going into a second or even a third wave. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, concerning that we might not have got all of the lessons in the, the first and or second waves. Um, what, what do you think that we should be doing differently? Um, I'll start off with you, Sue. I was hoping you were going to come to me last. <laughs> uh, look, in the country I'm in, we are not a shining example at all. Um, it's tricky to know what we should be doing differently. I, I'm going to stick to my field of expertise, which is design. Um, we are so keen that our procurement processes are sorted out and that anything. I learned so much about ventilators. I didn't know there were fundamentally three different types of ventilators with theatre ones and ICU ones and transport ones. So my learning curve was great. Um, but, it, you know, if we if we had more standardisation, more understanding of the, the detail and tough. So the task analysis I showed, that needs to be done for everything that we do um, so that we actually can understand what we do. But there are things that we could do at a, at a fairly high level now which would make a difference in the next two weeks, in the next two months, in the next six months. But it's having that state of mind to want to do it. And unfortunately, we're not the shining example in the UK. I'm looking to you and other countries to give better <laughs> examples than we'll have. So. Thanks, Sue. Well, let's look to another country. Um, Andrew, what, what, what do you think we should be doing differently? Yeah, I think we need to have, um, I, I think this concept of, the, of, of uh, failing fast and failing often is really critical so that we uh, do expect that what we start with um, is not going to be what we finish with. I do think it's really critical that we're able to take a quick first step with an action. But, you know, to, to Chris described the intubation box, uh, which we did usability testing on and, and many have done even more robust testing than, than we have. That's not an example of a quick first step. That's just an example of a bad idea. That's, that if it would have been a great idea and then they tested it and then realized that it wasn't that useful. We're, that's where it fell short. Um, so going from idea to implementation it, it is not good. Going from idea to testing, uh, iteratively revising and then realizing that it's not a good idea you then have a, an approach that's that much better. 
uh, and that it does need to be done quickly, but we really need to understand that, that um, uh, quick is key. Uh, and, and I think that we still take an approach that has long been that, you know, uh, well, let's re send the policy through multiple committees and get a, get a sign off. And we, we don't have time for that, but we don't have time for bad ideas to then be pushed through either. So that we do need some robust testing, so some um, sense with bringing in human factors folks to watch how we learn and how we how we function. Um, we can't divorce the idea that uh, that human behavior is often predictable, though not in a way that we want it to be. And so we must uh, watch that, and then we can design solutions that actually make sense uh, uh, for the long term. Fantastic, thanks, Jen. What do you think we should be doing differently? Um, I've been thinking that uh, it, it would be very useful to take the kind of team that I've been working in and look at outbreaks outside the hospital. Uh, you know, if there's a, an outbreak associated, for example, with a gym or a restaurant, to actually go in with the, the, the combination, uh, because we can look at then at behavior, we can look at the protocols, we can look at the interactions. And I think that that might be a way of perhaps being able to learn some lessons that haven't been applied otherwise, because normally now it's just, let's shut down and do a deep cleaning and hope next time it'll be different and nothing changes. And so maybe there's something that a, a similar team could do going in. I'm not looking for any extra work, thanks, but I'm, I'm suggesting this as a model for elsewhere. Thanks very much. I think uh, that, that kind of rings true here in uh, in Melbourne around aged care facilities. I think that would be great to have your your team go in and, and have a look uh, at our aged care facilities. Uh, Chris. Uh, so I, I guess for me, I'd echo everything that's already been heard uh, said. Um, however, I think for me, if I'm going to come up with one last word, I think it's uh, that. Um, um, staff safety and well-being uh, is something that we need to do better. There's been too many people who've got sick um, in this pandemic working in healthcare and aged care. We've got a poor history of looking after ourselves in healthcare um, and we have the tools and strategies from user-centred design, human factors and uh, safety science to actually do this better. Uh, so I hope that before there is another wave, certainly in Melbourne, um, that we can find ways to to prioritise that and do it better. Yeah, great point, great point. Well, thank you to all four of our panellists. Thank you for giving your time. Thank you for sharing your experience and, and the awesome work that you, you've all been doing. I'm sure um, that the, the people who are online and uh, we're, we are getting messages through great, great presentations. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it, it's been fantastic to, to hear about it. Um, Thank you also to the production crew, uh, to Dylan and Jamie uh, behind the scenes and to Gary for fielding all the questions. Um, and uh, I hope that this is not the, uh, the, the last of these seminars, these webinars. Uh, I hope that uh, um, we're, we're going to have more human factors chat going on into the future. Um, I, I hope that it's not related to a pandemic. I hope that's all behind us sometime soon too. So thank you, thank you all very much. Uh, don't forget that the uh, recording will be available on Monday uh, on the YouTube channel um, and uh, feel free to visit our website where there's a whole heap of other interesting stuff. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.